While its quality has been the center of many discussions, few can deny the success of the Uncharted franchise. Uncharted 4 is a strange game because despite improving on many aspects of the series, it is seen as arguably the most divisive. A glimmer of this divide was seen with the release of Uncharted 3, but it was less of a debate over whether it was good or bad, and more over if it was better or worse than 2. With 4, more began saying that it ruined the franchise, or that it was just terrible. Me? I played it a few months after release, and I thought it was great. A mature swan song to finish the series, or at least Nate's story. I grew up playing the Uncharted games, and 4 felt like it really grew up with me, offering a more mature story for a now more mature player. The first Uncharted game had a great concept and was a competent title, with a handful of kinks to iron out. Naughty Dog understood the assignment though and delivered Uncharted 2, which is to this day regarded by many as the peak of the series. Uncharted 3 delivered a higher budget but stumbled in storytelling, leading many to be disappointed. After that, there was nothing for a while. To hold us over, we had a few new Tomb Raider games, which I've covered on my channel, but many believe that Drake's deception would be Nate's last adventure. And fortunately, we were wrong. Uncharted 4 had been in development since the release of 3, but there were concerns regarding direction, especially after Amy Hennig left. Due to the success of The Last of Us, Neil Druckmann took up the role of director. I believe this was why Uncharted took a more mature approach, and the parallels between this and The Last of Us are pretty clear from the moment you boot the game. But this change in tone was not at the expense of the Uncharted identity. A Thief's End feels like a proper step forward without abandoning its roots, and the new features here, some more indicative of the time than others, are welcome additions for both myself and critics across the board, with 9 out of 10 after 9 out of 10 being thrown towards the game. In recent years, it seems the discussion around Uncharted 4 has been one focused on its story more than anything else. This is likely due to Uncharted 4 actually having a story, unlike the last few entries, and as a result of the Uncharted gameplay formula being relatively unchanged since its first entry. That said, I'll be taking a similar approach, focusing on the story and the characters throughout, but don't worry, the gameplay will get all of the love it deserves. I'll also clarify now that there will be many things that I won't talk about in the usual detail, such as the gunplay, because I've already talked about it in regards to the previous entries, and I don't want to retread my steps. This will apply to criticisms too, unless I have more to say, and if other YouTube videos are an indicator, I will probably have a lot to say. It also seemed as though the biggest issue people had with this game was in regards to some of its characters, which seem to be missing the mark more often than not. Because on the whole, Uncharted 4 is a game that somehow continues to innovate the series, albeit suffering from the diminishing returns, and delivers a story that while having more issues than the previous entries, has more positives, delivering some series high points. Though a mature story is appreciated, Uncharted can at times take itself too seriously, leading to a more sophisticated experience at the sacrifice of plain old fun. That in and of itself is important to note the audience for this game. I've said before that I found the Uncharted games are best when expecting fun. I never desired Uncharted to have a more serious tone, and I appreciated that while the set pieces and excuses for gameplay were at times ridiculous, it was done in the name of fun. This isn't to say that I can't appreciate a deep and serious plot, but I appreciate Uncharted as a series that filled the dumb action game genre that I'd play when I wanted some low stakes, enjoyable distractions. So as someone who appreciated the emphasis on the over the top, goofy, dumb action, how does this game hold up? Well remarkably well. Something that Uncharted had a great balance between was the hyper-realism of its art style and its Jack and Daxter reminiscent animations. This was clear in the first game, but as the series went on, the animations and series as a whole became driven by pure realism. Uncharted had all the traits of an action movie, but its visuals were always lacking. That's not a criticism. When the first few games were released, it was astounding that the graphics looked so good, but it was still clear that it was a video game. With the power of the PS4, it was now possible to truly blur the lines between the game and reality. Sure, the uncanny valley is one visible from many angles, but when a character has visible pores, that valley is obscured. There are so many wallpaper-worthy moments here, and they all move at a locked 60 frames per second on the PlayStation 5. Not only that, but the game looks even crisper, and we now have the whole Uncharted series, barring Golden Abyss, in 60 frames per second, which is great. I'll admit, there were a few more glitches than I remember on this remaster, but overall the game ran fantastic. The cutscenes in Uncharted games have always been exceptional, but here, the facial expressions especially are on the next level and still rival the likes of today's releases. There are few games that properly capture the look on someone's face when you can see the gears turning. When Sam comes up with the lights out plan, you can physically see the small details on his face as he works through the thought. These are nuances that are typically not captured in games, and it's one of the reasons that this game leaves the uncanny valley for me. The cinematography is also genuinely astounding, and I appreciate that the linearity of Uncharted's gameplay is used to a greater extent narratively. What's most shocking is that the music is used in a similar fashion. When Nate starts playing with his Nerf guns in the attic, the combat music starts playing, and the OST here is actually my favorite in the series. It has the relaxing acoustics to accompany a seemingly normal life, and the usual orchestrals for adventuring, but I want to call your attention to one sound. This 
uh, whistle thing, I, I don't really know anything about music, is representative of Nathan's lust for adventure. Whenever his interest is peaked or when the call for adventure strikes, we always hear the same whistle. We first hear this whistle when Nate looks at the tropical painting on the wall, and the whistle drowns out every other sound as he is whisked away into another daydream. When Sam tells Nate about the other cross, right as his eyes light up like a Christmas tree, realizing the potential in front of him, that whistle is there again. It always accompanies the allure of adventure. It's a detail that goes unnoticed by many, and yet it has such a large impact. Environments this time around look spectacular and lived in, which is especially clear inside the residential areas. Nate's home is a chaotic mausoleum, with the attic acting as a graveyard to an old life. One that Nate can't help but spend time in, reminiscing. But this Nathan Drake has changed. He's left his dude rating life behind, and his neglect to the cleanliness of his home is a reflection of his own uncertain place in life. He's left the treasure hunting behind, but it's a constant decision and one he must make every day. This is something many people will need to confront at one point in their lives, one way or another. The idea that you need to abandon a passion or even an addiction for your own self-benefit. We'll talk about this more, but the reason I draw attention to the cluttered nature of Nate and Elena's home is because it reflects his life. And even later on when his home is decorated with the same dirty laundry, I believe it's for a different reason. The outside environments are where the game truly shines. So much so that I'd like to admit a fault in a completely different review. In my Tomb Raider 2013 video, I explained that the game looked bland, but I excused it because how good can mud and trees really look when a color palette is just green and brown? Uncharted 4 is a perfect example of how to make these muddy and gross environments look vibrant and luscious, even during stormier weather. I won't indulge in too many other comparisons, but the point here is to say that the fauna feels beautiful, but never overshadows the other works of beauty on display. Architecture is perfection, outfits are stylish, and it's just uncharted. The series has looked exceptional thus far, and this game takes it to the next level. The gameplay has seen marginal improvements too, but its replayability is sacrificed for maturity. As is the case with the presentation, the gameplay is largely unchanged, at least in the movement and gunplay department. The major difference here is the activities you actually perform. The Uncharted games previously focused on movement and gunplay with a pinch of stealth for garnish, but nothing in between save for a few quick time events. This was fine because all these aspects were carried by the absurd set pieces. Yeah, I know, running and tapping X is by no means mechanically engaging, but when doing that in a flooding ship, I'd say there's enough to keep me entertained. But Nate's getting a little too old for these things, don't you think? And as such, Uncharted 4 needs to step up its game. Or does it? Yes, there are some new mechanics here like the sword fighting, the driving, and the diving, but there's also an appropriate amount of the mundane. I realize I'm about to praise boredom, but as established, the narrative plays a greater role in the gameplay and vice versa. When the game begins, we get introduced to something new and fun immediately. Driving the boat in the heat of a gunfight, paralleling the beginning of the trilogy, quotes about jamming a man of fortune and all, but right as we are about to reach the climax of the action, we're pulled out of it and brought to the ironic orphanage, where we do some slick scaling of towers before flashing forward to the Panamanian jail. It's here that we get some combat, puzzles, and traversal, but never more than one at a time. I've stated previously that Uncharted is at its best when its gameplay facets intersect, and Naughty Dog knows this. I believe that's why the first few chapters that act as tutorials are meant to not be boring, but to leave us wanting more. By the end of our time in the prison, we get an epic escape, and what happens at the height of this action is we are pulled away, again this time drowning in the slow tranquility of the ocean, the calmest waters we'll see in the game. I don't know about you, but all I could think was, what the hell, we just got into the action here, what are we doing? We went from adventures and fistfights to scrounging for cargo? We went from a Nathan in the early stages of his obsession, one that had ambition in his eyes and a witty remark for every possibility, to one that flat out declines the opportunity to go looking for treasure. Hey, maybe you should hang out then, see if you can find some other treasures down there. <laughs> Nah, I'm good. We then ride up with the cargo and spend time talking to our crewmates? This isn't what we signed up for. And by the time we do get what we signed up for, there's still something missing. We get an action-packed escape, but as Sam. We want the adventure just as much as Nate does, and we don't actually get that until chapter 6, roughly an hour and a half into the game, and man, is it satisfying. This is an expert way of teasing the player, explaining the mechanics, having enough narrative here to make repeat playthroughs engaging, and making them want to play the game more, which I certainly did. The actual gunplay this time around is much tighter, and feels as accurate as it can be with the bullet spread. And I've rethought my criticisms regarding the bullet spread too. In previous entries, I criticized the lack of precision, but I wonder if this was done to make players spray and pray more. Nate isn't some John Wick, 
and is always portrayed as a very lucky average Joe. And perhaps I want to lean into the inexperienced running and gunning like he would. I still don't like the spread, but a different perspective couldn't hurt. I like the gun selection this time around with a decent variety, but a lack of suppressed pistols really hurt replayability. In Uncharted 3, you could at least give yourself a silenced pistol on repeat playthroughs to engage in some stealth. And despite this game having the best stealth system in the series, a silencer on anything is absent. We'll see more examples of a lack of replayability, but sticking to our guns, let's talk about enemies. They are the generic run-of-the-mill soldiers, and that's it. Uncharted 4 remarks the second time that a supernatural force has not been included, and this means that the enemy variety takes a hit, but I can accept this change. Considering that the game wanted a grounded story, a limited selection is sound, and while in a vacuum this is technically worse than previous entries, when looking at the bigger picture, it works. I further appreciate that Naughty Dog didn't opt for the all too common enemy archetypes, such as the suicide bombers like those seen in the infamous games, because those kinds of enemies would have me bald by 23. Keeping in mind the bigger picture is important when discussing the Uncharted series and why I've often disliked the idea of only discussing one facet of the game, because Uncharted has always been greater than the sum of its parts. I know I am looking at many aspects in a vacuum, but that comes with the territory of an in-depth video. But I bring this up to explain that the lack of enemy variety was not a problem for me because the enemy AI, the set pieces, and the tools at my disposal more than made up for it. Enemies will rush you, but not with harming themselves in mind. If you shoot one, chances are they'll run to cover, but their updated AI is showcased best in the revamped stealth. The stealth in previous games was always an option, but it was clear that it was unintended. Perhaps it's because of Nate's age, but he sticks to the bushes far more this time around. Move slowly in bushes to not be spotted, enemies have detection times that are forgiving but by no means easy, and while this is minimalistic compared to the contemporaries, it also works. Uncharted, whether through a desire to keep things simple or an iron will, did not add a thief vision for you to use during stealth, not allowing our average Joe to spot enemies through walls. There is a thief vision in the bonus options, but this in and of itself feels like a joke at the expense of every other stealth series, with enemies and allies being highlighted in blue and red, and the rest of the world being entirely devoid of color. Not even a tint for good measure. Your allies can help you, often pointing out enemies that are hard to spot, highlighting them temporarily, but that's it. The best part of this thief vision joke that the game is seemingly playing is that the enemy layouts are challenging and fair enough that I never felt that something like this was actually required. My only complaint is that stealth is near required to be done in close proximity. A silencer, again, would help add variety and could be used for distractions, but in its current form, you're forced to either melee for a ghost run or cause anonymous chaos with grenades and dynamite. Aerial takedowns are in addition to the stationary and ledge takedowns and are way too fun to perform, especially when paired with the rope, as you can dive from a high point and then swing on top of somebody. The rope swing is indicative of the game's release, as every game from 2015 and 16 had a grappling hook of sorts, but this is one of the better iterations. Of course, with Uncharted's movement, verticality plays a solid role here for both you and your enemy, and this acts as one of stealth's biggest strengths. Many layouts have snipers on high vantage points, barring anyone below from being taken out, so now the goal is to make it to the vantage point without being seen and taking out the sniper before getting to everyone else. But the best part is, you don't even need to do that. You could just walk past everyone, skipping the encounter. It's a small option, but it goes a long way and feels realistic. The embodiment of being too old for this shit is just saying, eh, I won't deal with it unless I have to. Outside of combat, the climbing has seen one very slight change that scratches a strange itch in my monkey brain. Nate reaches for ledges. You can still get around by Spider-Manning up walls, but now, simply pointing the stick where you want to go will prompt a slower animation of Nate clamoring to the next handheld. This is less efficient than the Olympic vertical leaps, but it plays into this idea of Nate getting older and more sluggish. I ended up going through most of the game climbing like this. There's more variety in the animations, and it immersed me more than any previous game's climbing did. Movement additions are restricted to slopes and ropes, often being placed one after another, but it never reaches any proper platforming climax. Perhaps it doesn't need to, as while a challenging platforming system could have been more fun, the climbing this time around due to its grounded nature can feel oddly tranquil at times, in stark contrast. One of the most stunning chapters in the game is near the end. Chapter 21 sees you chasing after Samuel Drake throughout the unnamed island of Libertalia, but there's minimal music, minimal dialogue, and no combat. There's a solid five minute stretch where no ledges give way, no bridges break beneath your weight. Couple this with the luscious fauna and we have a match made in a blissful peace, scaling a cliff that overlooks a sight of nature many couldn't dream of. And what does Nate have to say about this? Absolutely nothing. This beauty of nature was touched on in Uncharted 3, notably in the desert, but finally this vision is fully realized and its impact exponential as it sits next to the action. 
peace and chaos are relative tones, and the lull of one cannot be properly appreciated without the high octane of the other. Floating through these albeit short transitionary spaces between set pieces skimming on the surface of the story makes the eventual return to the deeper plot and action one that is well paced. A Thief's End never hits the brakes, it simply eases up on the gas. A moment rarely overstays its welcome. While many adore the flight through the desert in Uncharted 3, Nathan goes through a near comical amount of close calls throughout the game, extending the set pieces for arguably longer than necessary. Uncharted 4 has a set piece, like a building collapsing, and in line with its realistic tone, it ends. Once the building turns to rubble and rubble to dust, it's given time to settle. This allows these set pieces to be more memorable, and not exhausting despite this game's relatively long runtime. And that's not to say there isn't much action overall. There's an entire chapter and a half dedicated to escaping the Panamanian jail we've heard so much about, and Scotland has a chain of stealth and combat back to back. And I like it because by the time you get to the auction, it'll be the first time you're required to use your skills in tandem with each other. The traversal and shooting spheres begin overlapping, and there's bound to be blunders along the way. By the time you get to Scotland, though, you've gained or regained your bearings, now capable of handling the gauntlet of scenarios coming your way. The difficulty curve is smooth, and the usual suspects are responsible. Enemies with bigger guns and eventually bigger explosives fill out the ever-increasing number of guards at each encounter. I would say that my only complaint is that some of these endgame scenarios truly feel as though you're taking down a small army, with the number of overlapping sightlines reaching above 15. Fortunately, if you're like me and tend to reset any time you're spotted, you'll appreciate that the checkpoints were merciful, and repeat playthroughs are accounted for. This is my favorite new feature, and it's that you can replay specific scenarios within a chapter. Every major encounter can be played over and over, a small quality of life feature, but one I haven't seen replicated since. It cuts down on all the fluff between set pieces, which is normally filled with dialogue that after the third playthrough begins to go in one ear and out the other. Speaking of which, those set pieces continue with the grounded themes, and while don't top the sheer absurdity of the train segment, and thusly don't stick out in memory as much, they never fail to entertain. Climbing the clock tower, moving through the falling watchtower, driving through the city in the 4x4, and of course, the final fight against Wraith. This is one of the few boss fights in the game, and I've seen it criticized for being mechanically bare. And that is a valid criticism, but you guys know what series we're in, right? I've stopped expecting mechanical depth from Uncharted, but... Either way, it sees you fighting with square and dodging with the right and left face buttons corresponding with the direction of the attack. Wraith will switch sides mid-combo, but it wasn't challenging but the novelty was enough to carry almost the whole fight. By the end, I'll admit it does begin to overstay its welcome, but it ends quickly after. While a melee fight may seem inappropriate, I like the idea presented here of the thieves of present times paralleling the thieves of old. Though there are some narrative issues with this, but for now let's focus on the fight, which is my favorite of the series. I mentioned that I wasn't a fan of the first two games' final battles, and Uncharted 3 was a marginal improvement, even if it was a glorified quick time event. Here is a similar sentiment, but with the added narrative depth it holds more weight. That and Talbot sucked. The other marginal fight here is against Nadine, twice. These fights function similarly to the Talbot fights from Drake's Deception, and so my thoughts are the same. Adding dialogue was nice enough, but both these fights are essentially set pieces. Typically, a set piece will see you only engaging in one facet. When the inevitable car chase shows up this time around, the rope is added for spice, but it's ultimately the same shooting from a vehicle jumping to another rinse and repeat. Others see you quickly scaling a structure that is collapsing, and I appreciate that the mechanics here are so shallow in these moments because it allows your hands to go on autopilot whilst your eyes glaze over with the awe of sensory overload. The boss fights achieve the same thing. Yes, complex mechanics can add to a set piece. It's far easier to feel like a badass if, as the player, you are required to pull off difficult gameplay feats. But Uncharted's priorities have been cinematic experience first, gameplay second. And by that metric, I think these fights succeed. Alright, enough praise. It's time to talk about something I absolutely despise about this game, and that is collectibles. The treasures are acceptable. They are easy to spot and reward you for poking around. Well, that's actually the issue, the rewards. The guns available here are slim, lacking a silenced pistol or tranquilizer darts, or anything outside of loud guns and explosives. As far as modifiers and filters, it's pretty good. Slow motion, bullet time, flip world, low gravity, it's all fun and adds variety to the consecutive playthroughs. However, the lack of skin swaps is severely disappointing. In previous entries, you could swap Nate's model with any other character, such as Elena or Sully in their different outfits. But the most egregious absence is of Donut Drake. I can't project myself onto Mr. Sixpack in his 40s, okay? I need someone with a little me on their bones. Seriously, the lack of options on this front severely hinders the replayability and fun factor. It was always enjoyable seeing the massive donut Drake soar through the sky on his way to slam some enemies, and it would have been even better in this game. 
It appears that Naughty Dog did this with hopes of keeping integrity within the story and to not offend anyone. To quote Druckmann, I didn't want to have a laugh at someone's expense. I thought we matured beyond that. And I can totally get behind this idea, even if as an overweight person I still found it humorous. But I think restricting the characters you play as just takes away the fun for seemingly no reason. And this extends past Donut Drake. Let me play as Rafe, Sam, Sully, Nadine. Instead, we can just choose their outfits for their appearance in a chapter, which isn't that much fun. I know it's a nitpick, but genuinely, these options from previous games were some of my favorite parts, and I'm disappointed not seeing it here. Back to the good. I mentioned the different gameplay facets that fill in the time between set pieces like driving the car, swimming, driving a boat, but we haven't talked about the puzzles. The puzzles this time around are by far the best in the series, hands down. Previous games had an issue with the journal, which rather than offer hints for the player, just gave them the answer. On top of this, the answers were often so easy that one could stumble upon them accidentally. Uncharted 3 saw some steps in the right direction as it offered puzzles based on logic rather than following instructions, and here the notebook offers hints, but the actual solving of the puzzle is left up to the player as it should be. The worst of the puzzles is within the clock tower, as it's near identical to the instruction manual puzzles of Uncharted 1, but the large difference is that the set piece and novelty of climbing the gears is entertaining enough to carry what many would not even consider a puzzle. The best of the puzzles here is actually a tie. It's my video, I'm cheating. The first is when you have to configure the sigils on Avery's secret tomb underneath the previous clock tower puzzle. You have to look at the icons, find out who they belong to, and then turn them in a way that their sides connect. It's simple, but there's enough complexity later on where some of the symbols and their owners are obscured, leading the player to fill in the gaps. The game allows you to turn the icons within your journal before actually trying to, which offers a quality of life and it allowed the journal to be a tool, but not the solution. This is only rivaled by the puzzle which sees you jotting down some symbols and eventually using it to get through one of Avery's traps. There are symbols with squares surrounding them and each symbol has a series of safe squares to walk on, with the others leading to death. It's one of the more simple puzzles, but emphasizes something I appreciate about the gameplay broadly, but specifically the puzzles, which is that they never overstay their welcome. The Roman numeral puzzle within Drake's Fortune was fine enough, but it lasted for too long. The puzzles and mechanics here are, for the most part, used once or twice before being dropped. It lets moments hang in memory for longer. On the whole, while the gameplay has not seen the biggest improvements, it has greater diversity that allows the long run time to not feel overwhelming. A virtue of a shorter Uncharted is that there's a denser plot with more action, but this leads to burnout and an exhaustion from the over the top. But here, there is more to the transitionary segments than dialogue or puzzles, which are significantly better here too. But the biggest improvement to the Uncharted series this game graces us with is in the plot department. The Uncharted series has never had good plots, and I don't think that's a hot take. Sure, they were never terrible, but there wasn't much to it at all. The games often presented ideas and nothing more. This time around, we have a story with more meat on the bone, so to speak, and it lends itself to a game that while still succeeding or suffering from its tropes and cliches, has well-developed ideas and themes that make for the best story in the series. The game begins in the heat of the action with Nate and Sam before the two are seemingly shipwrecked. We are then shown Nate in his Catholic orphanage where he sneaks out with his brother to go exploring. We cut back to Nate and Sam in a Panamanian jail working with Rafe Adler, a rich boy funding the Drake's hunt for Henry Avery's treasure. Their man on the inside is the prison warden, who after attempting to get a cut out of the treasure, is killed by Rafe. This causes a riot and the boys end up leaving the prison, but not before Sam is killed in the chaos. Fast forward again and we get a taste of a retired Drake who scrounges for underwater cargo, and spends his evenings doing paperwork in a messy home. Thankfully, he shares that home with his now wife, Elena Fisher. Things are normal until Drake gets an offer for an illegal job out in Malaysia, but determined to keep out of trouble, says no. Yet another wrench is thrown in his plans, though, manifested through his brother Sam, who thanks to the help of Hector Alcazar, the local drug lord, is alive and out of prison, but in order to pay his debt to Alcazar, he must find Henry Avery's treasure, and needs Nate's help. Nate can't really say no, so the two pair up with Sully and head to an auction to find the other cross needed to find the treasure. They run into Rafe again and his friend Nadine, who owns Shoreline. Nate runs into Nadine one-on-one -on -one and the auction is basically turned into a war zone, but the crew is able to leave and find that their next clue is in Scotland. Scotland goes as well as you can imagine, and eventually their hijinks continue to Madagascar, where after a ton of action and treasure hunting, Elena shows up having figured out Nate's lie. Despite her anger, the crew has moved on and head to an island, which is where we started the game. After tracking down the treasure to the lost city of Libertalia, we learn that 12 legendary pirates, including Avery and Thomas II, decided to pool their loot together. But this leads to betrayal from within, leaving just Avery and two alive. While this mystery unravels, Nate and Sam run into Rafe and Nadine, with Rafe revealing that the Alcazar story was a lie, and that Rafe was the one to break Sam out of prison. Rafe's tensions are high, Nate is sent off a cliff, and as he hits the ground, we get another flashback where Nate and Sam break into the home of their past mother's associate, only for said associate to die in front of them. After ditching the cops, the two decide to abandon their legal
legal last names, Morgan for Drake. Upon waking, Elena has tracked Nate down thanks to Sully and the two make their way back to Sam. While doing so, the two end up discovering that Avery went mad, attempting to take the spoils off of the island and booby trapping every part of the island he could. When catching up to Sam and meeting up with Sully, the gang decides after some pushback from Sam to stop searching for the treasure and for once quit while they're ahead. That is, until Sam decides at the last minute to change his mind prompting Drake to head after him. He spots Rafe and Nadine arguing about the lack of spoils thus far, and the heavy cost for something that isn't even guaranteed. Once it is revealed that Nadine's men have turned on her in favor of Rafe's money, Drake follows Rafe who is on his way to investigate the boat. On the boat, Nate finds Sam pinned under some wood with an angry Rafe reveling in finding the treasure. Nadine then shows up and traps the two in the room. Rafe attempts to kill Nate, but fails, and then Nate escapes the sinking ship with Sam and no loot. On the way back home, the gang parts ways and we flash forward to Nate and Elena, as she reveals that Sam snuck coins into his pocket on the way out, making everyone, including them, filthy rich. With this money, the two purchase the company Nate works for, and leads a long life of legal treasure hunting, broadcasting their efforts on Elena's now revived TV show. We then flash forward again for an epilogue where we play as Cassie Drake, discovering for the first time her parents' past as pirates. It's there that the game ends on a happily ever after. The story here had a lot of depth and more interesting B-plots than previous entries, with enough foreshadowing and connections to make even a second playthrough worthy of not skipping the cutscenes. Also, I find that a lot of reviews of the plot I see online are muddled with nitpicks. While it's fine to pick apart every aspect of the story, I don't often find it enjoyable, and that's not to disregard the actual problems here, but to say that I won't be going for the usual low-hanging fruit. Yes, it is strange that Sam is able to sneak home a bunch of coins in his cargo pants without making any jingling sounds with every movement, and yes, Sam says that the bike is a gift that can't wait until Christmas despite the calendar saying it's January, but these are inconsequential to the overall story so they don't bother me. What I like is a lot of the connections and foreshadowing that's made here. Nate will have a conversation about wanting a dog, and this is paid off in the epilogue as he has a dog. His home is full of inanimate foreshadowing and callbacks. You can find his and Elena's wedding photos, but eventually, when you play as Cassie, there are photos of her. There are two points in which you visit Nate's home, once as Nate in Chapter 4 and once in the epilogue as Cassie. Both times, Nate's home is an absolute mess. Laundry clutters the floor and the materials of shelves is completely obscured by knickknacks and trinkets from past adventures. If the gameplay up to this point didn't reinforce the idea that you are past your prime, then reflecting on the previous adventures certainly will. I believe that Nate's home looks like a bomb went off in it because he's unhappy. He's discontent with his life right now, so finding the motivation to do the more menial tasks like laundry gets pushed to the wayside. It could also be because Nate spent so long on the streets with his brother and on adventures that he never learned how to properly care for a home. What is more interesting is that when the game ends, his new home is still a mess. I think the reason it is still messy this time is due to him and Elena being capable of indulging in their passions so much that they find themselves getting distracted. Because while both of them are responsible adults, they both are victim to the obsessions of their passions. One of the major themes of Uncharted 4 is obsession, which while the same as Uncharted 3, is actually explored here in both subtle and overt ways so it feels brand new. Nate loves treasure hunting, nobody's questioning that, but Nate will often do this to his own detriment, allowing his obsessions and competitive nature to get him in some unwise predicaments. He always begins by hunting for personal interest, but once the antagonist is introduced, his motivation shifts to accommodate the competition. Nate wanted to find Shambhala, but he also desperately wants to get one over on Flynn, and eventually wants to prevent the sap of Shambhala from getting into the wrong hands. In Uncharted 3, when against Marlowe, it was presented as an obsession with finding the treasure, but I now believe that this was an obsession with winning. Nate, throughout his whole life, has been patronized and told he's not capable of doing something, and even when those people are right, he feels the need to prove them wrong. Here, this is done the same, but in tandem with the obsession with adventure. I mentioned it already, but the conversation with Elena in the kitchen is a perfect example of this. He is so enamored by even the thought of treasure hunting that he can't help but space out, daydreaming about it. While it is admirable seeing someone who has discovered and loves their passion, it's also sad. Nate has a partner, a home, a stable income, and yet he still isn't satisfied. Even in his current comfortable life, he'd rather be facing the barrel of a gun if it meant adventure. I, I say it's sad, but... I also feel that it's beautiful and relatable. Not in the sense that I enjoy death-defying adventures, but that there are so many who have discovered their passions in life and would sacrifice everything to do it. Some haven't discovered that thing yet, but those who have, you know exactly how Nate feels. I know I do. My ultimate passion is making videos. It's my ultimate outlet, the perfect canvas for my thoughts to splatter, and it's something I enjoy so much that everything else in my life has become boring in comparison. That doesn't mean that, like Nate, there aren't struggles. There are. There are always going to be challenges, but you're happy doing what you do despite all that. 
I've had moments before where I will mentally check out of a conversation because I just thought of the coolest thumbnail, or I've had a revelation about whatever game I'm writing about. It sounds sad on the surface, but nothing else in my life brings me more satisfaction and pure bliss than expressing myself through this medium. And it's been that way since I first started making videos at age 11. And now I, like Nate, have found a way to sustain myself through my passion. And it's why, as annoying as it may seem, I thank you for your support so much. My gratitude is as endless as my passion, and Uncharted provides a great commentary on the challenges that come with pursuing your passions. Nate, at the beginning of the game, is willing to sacrifice everything for just one last ride. He almost without hesitation lies to Elena, his wife, to help his brother, and he nearly loses her over it. He keeps pretending to justify it as saving Sam, but everyone knows that's not his real reason for going. By the time his journey comes to a close, he is ready to leave it behind, and even when he does go to rescue Sam, he does not bother grabbing coins on the way out. He's there for his new treasure, his family. A major part of Nate's journey is indulging in his passions but not letting it consume him, and his realization of this is why he ultimately survives. Personally, this is where the relatability ends, as while I've sacrificed some time with friends or hours of my sleep for my passions, I'm not at a point where I'd risk my safety for it. That doesn't mean it isn't an interesting concept to explore, as taking the sentiment to its extreme is clearly interesting, and that's not to say that people don't go to that extent, but that I just have little experience in it, and thusly little reflection. Sam struggles with a similar obsession, but he has an added layer of greed. Sam's time in prison has clearly not treated him well, and it makes sense that someone who shits in the same room as he sleeps would want everything and nothing less by the time he gets out, but his greed is what flashes his life before his eyes. While this is a flawed mindset, I can understand the rationale, and it makes Sam more human. He too is willing to risk his relationships with his family, lying to Nate's face. I believe that's why he's so opposed to Sully too, and anyone other than Nate, because he can't manipulate them like he can with Nathan, and god forbid one of them knows Alcazar. You can even see this in cutscenes, as when he's pitching something, he focuses on convincing Nate rather than the others because he knows he calls the shots. Sam shows a clear mental tug of war between greed and his own safety, and it's a smart way of showing the player where this obsession and greed gets them. We see the parallels between Sam and Rafe and Henry and Two, greedy men who both died at the hands of their own distrust. We can't show Nate succumbing to greed because he's a main character, and not many stories can end with the character's death. But showing Avery and Two suffering the consequences, and then Sam with one foot in the grave, is all the reinforcement we need. Something that made Rafe more interesting was how he was the opposite to Sam. Sam had nothing, and spent most of his life in prison. Meanwhile, Rafe inherited his father's riches and had everything handed to him. He has never had to work for anything. He started at the top, and his greed is not for the monetary riches, but for the legacy of being the one to find the treasure. There's a deep-rooted insecurity in his attitude towards the Drakes. The reality is, Rafe has thrown all of his money to this treasure, but hasn't done enough of the work, and doesn't have the passion to properly succeed. He feels a frustration in the idea that he, despite his resources, is being beaten by two average Joes who had nothing but a little bit of luck. The issue is that this is barely shown throughout the game. Rafe is one of the best developed villains, sure, but it's only due to one line that reveals a glance at his inner monologue. Don't send it to me. I had everything handed to me on a goddamn silver platter. I earned this. Otherwise, Adler falls victim to being yet another underdeveloped Uncharted villain, but there is no rich Uncharted villain without their partner. We had Eddie, and Navarro, Flynn, Talbot, and now we have… <sighs> I guess we gotta talk about Nadine. The largest criticism I see levied against Nadine is done within her first appearance. When Nadine shows up, she takes down Nate and eventually holds off both Sam and Nate. A few people have taken issue with this because not only is Nadine outnumbered, but she's marginally smaller than Drake. That said, I don't see the issue here. I get it, you know, bigger guys should be able to win, but Nadine is clearly trained in fighting, whereas Nate and Sam are not. Some have argued that Nate has fighting experience taking down guys far larger than her, which I'll admit is true. I mean, look at Uncharted 3's opening. But what about when a no-name goon in Uncharted 3 just manhandles Nate in the cargo plane? In this game, even in the prison, Nate is overpowered by thugs on multiple occasions, so why does it matter when someone who is actually qualified to kick his ass does? Nadine is again not some pool hall goon, but a trained professional. Look at her technique, that isn't stuff you learn on the streets. There's also the fact that Nate has been retired for a while, and is pushing 40, being approximately 38, and Sam is 45. Nadine is getting up there too at 35, but that is still a large difference between her and Sam, and a large enough difference between her and Nathan. This is also, within cutscenes often considered canon, one of the first fights Nate's been in in over three years. Meanwhile, Nadine has been on active duty and assumedly training this whole time. 
It's also not as though Nadine just pummels him. He gets some decent shots in, and while it's clear that Nate is outclassed, he still holds his own. A rather disingenuous point I often see is that she is able to take on both Sam and Drake at the same time. This is true, she can take them on, but she can't win. And not only does the game literally make her lose, but she even acknowledges that she can't win and is merely buying time. It's easy to call Nadine's skill unrealistic, but directly after this, Nate catches a gun from Sam while hanging off a light post. And I'll stop myself now because it's clear Nate can pull off feats of incredible coordination and strength. But when a different character matches that, suddenly it's a problem. Honestly, this sounds like the internet's hypersensitivity to politics. A few people get annoyed over it and then everyone else is now playing through the game looking for political messaging where there isn't. I've said it before that you can find politics in every corner of a game if you look hard enough, but if you are misinterpreting a trained specialist outmaneuvering a past as prime adventurer with no formal training as Naughty Dog wanting to shove female empowerment in your face, then I don't know what to tell you. I could tell you that Naughty Dog will often have a character overpower Drake for the sake of building tension and reminding you that Nate is just an average Joe. Look at Charlie, who's able to absolutely manhandle Nate in Drake's deception as a means of positioning him as a threat. The same is done with Talbot, who is also marginally smaller than Nate. If the motivation with Nadine was female empowerment, I doubt they would have her story end in her getting smacked by a man, having her mercenaries turn on her, and then having her leave the island no richer. She suffers some of the greatest long-term losses outside of Wraith. And also, beware playing the older games, as Chloe and Elena are both very capable women that in many ways break traditional roles. Apologies for the side tangent, but this argument with Nadine has always confused me, and admittedly my thoughts will likely fall on deaf ears, responding with the same counter-arguments of woke propaganda among other words that have lost all their meaning. Despite claiming to hate politics in their games, gamers can't seem to stop talking about it. Maybe that's because the problem isn't politics in games at all, it's just politics that the individual disagrees with. But we should discontinue the paradoxical means in which we discuss these things. Getting so up in arms about political messaging, especially ones like this that are vague enough as it is, ironically moves more discussion and thought towards politics. Being so hypervigilant towards political messaging means that you will ultimately find more of it. But perhaps it's not about politics at all, and the hatred towards Nadine in this scene is a manifestation of masculine insecurities, which would explain why the overt political themes mentioned in the collectibles are largely ignored, and even the overt political themes in other games are not met with the same opposition. Now, despite the hypocrisy I'm about to commit, I'm not going to comment on my feelings of the politics present here, because I lack the proper education to articulate my thoughts, and it would be unwise to use my platform to promote worldviews and may not be correct or educated, as opposed to just talking about a game I like. I just feel the need to bring this up because throughout many of the reviews of this game that I watched, I noticed this issue was a running theme, and it was worth mentioning. Anyways, let's get back to my specialty, dumb video games. And to help me, I have brought on giant Pokey Spyro who has his own thoughts on Nadine's fight. Now, I'd be lying if I said the lack of an ability to actually participate in these fights didn't drive me up the walls in my first playthrough. I remember mashing circle, only to realize that my dodge button was on vacation. But each time I come back to this game, I find myself appreciating them more and more in a narrative sense. And come on, you're not a real Uncharted fan if you don't love seeing Drake get thrown out the window non-stop. The Uncharted series is notorious for having this extreme disparity between gameplay and cutscene. I'm not here to pretend like 4 has this down pat, it doesn't. I love the addition of the grappling hook as much as the next guy, but the gameplay otherwise Otherwise, is practically a carbon copy of its predecessors. Meaning, Nate's hands aren't any less filthy despite him being this legendary hero. However, these punch-outs with Nadine are actually some of the few examples where the gameplay does complement the narrative circumstances. Prior to their first fight, there are very little to no interactive segments that actually give the player the impression that Nate is this old man. Given how consistent Uncharted gameplay is, for all I know, he's still in his 20s. Now, this really isn't a criticism at all. Because, hot take, I don't think anyone wants to play a game with a back problem mechanic where Nate moves as slow as molasses. The devs had to find some other method to get that feeling across, and what better way than by having her midlife crisis having Joe getting absolutely thrashed by a trained military leader. And despite this far more dire matchup, the tone is kept light and humorous with Nate cracking his usual one-liners, except with their effect amplified thanks to his extreme contrast to Nadine's nature. Okay, mango, mango. What are you on about? Oh, it's my safe word. Naughty Dog manages to maintain that fun feeling of Uncharted that us fans adore, while still accomplishing their essential mission of engaging the player in this different, coming out of retirement vibe. Given that him being washed up is half the premise, it was crucial that they got this across in more than just cutscenes. In my opinion, they achieved that here. The devs instantly get you on board with Nate's novel struggle because he gets his cheeks clapped by Nadine. Naughty Dog gets you to feel that age and expect Drake to perform accordingly. But I guess four years later, they just... Forgot how? Anyway, the point is, these fights are actually pretty dope, but maybe don't make an Uncharted spin-off fighting game if it's gonna play like this. Thanks. If you guys enjoy GPS, then you can find more of him in the link below. 
Regardless of the issues surrounding Nadine's power, few can deny that her and Rafe are, predictably, underdeveloped. There's a running theme throughout the game of inheritance. Rafe got money and the Drakes got nothing outside of the gene lottery, and Nadine got her father's militia that was failing. It's interesting to see that in order to pay off her company's debt and recoup their reputation, Nadine is working with Rafe who wants to build a reputation of his own. The two have similar motivations for finding the treasure, with the key difference being greed which leads one to their death, and the other to something as close to riches as they can get. The dynamic between the two was alright, as it seems Nadine, in almost a resentful motherly way, keeps Rafe in check. Exactly how you're going to be leaving in a goddamn Rafe. Body. But there isn't much development from either of them. I know Nadine gets more screen time in Lost Legacy, which I will cover in a different video, but here she falls victim to the uncharted villain role, meaning there's little for us to learn about her. Her and Rafe just needed more development and screen time. I wish I had more to say, but there isn't much to go on here. Fortunately, other side characters like Elena pick up the slack. The scenes with her were often to the detriment of Nate as she stole the show in my eyes. In fact, one of her best scenes is in the game's opening hours when she plays a game with Nate. The two are just talking, and while it is mundane, it's written so well that I couldn't help but love it. Her more disappointed scenes carry an equivalent weight, and when she does find out about Nate's lie, you can see her trust in him shatter. And Elena playing with her ring is not due to any nervousness or anxiety. Hell, anyone capable of punching this guy in the face has no fear. But it's because their marriage is compromised. She twists the ring around because their marriage is faltering. And the best part of the argument is that she isn't mad that Nate went on an adventure, she's mad that he lied. While Nate and Elena share their journey on the island with some tension, adventuring together is also integral to rekindling their trust, and making it clear to them that searching for clues and treasure hunting is what they live for. Elena has constantly had to remind Nate that she enjoys the adventure too, but she has her shit together, which is the largest difference between them. They share their passions, but complement each other so well. Nate brings the luck, and Elena brings the level-headed planning, but of course, Sully always has the wisecracks covered. Sully, this time around, like most entries, isn't given much development, and that's okay. He served his role as mentor well in the first three entries, so I don't mind him taking a back seat, especially since he's charming as ever. The story this time around, while following the same archetype of previous entries, succeeds where others failed. Rather than presenting a web of plot threads all leading nowhere, it has just a few that are more developed and thought-provoking. More importantly, the development given has ditched the immaturity for a story that stays grounded to the end. While the previous entries did little to stay grounded, any semblance of realism was shot when the supernatural element showed up. Surviving a plane or train crash is less fantastical when the bar is raised to an ancient race with teleporting abilities. A thief's end stays grounded until the end. Not entirely realistic, but it never loses its plausibility. Nate isn't a superhuman, he is just really lucky. And Uncharted is at its best when answering one question. What would it look like if the luckiest man in the world was in the most extreme situations? It isn't realistic but it's possible. And while many could argue that the teleporting demonic souls could also be real, it also isn't a stretch to say that it is highly, highly, highly unlikely. Not having anything to raise the bar of realism and recontextualize the whole playthrough at the end of the game does the plot favors in the pacing and consistency department. The lack of ghosts and ghoulies also prevents the plot from getting distracted, keeping the characters front and center. But like his previous entries, Uncharted 4 is a game that surpasses the sum of its parts. The addition of a rope swing takes the action to new heights, preventing the more grounded set pieces from feeling boring. The gunplay is the same as usual, though again, I suck at it, so don't confuse the footage on screen with poor controls. The voice acting is aided by the visuals, which often convey more than the dialogue does. When not looking at the faces, you'll be feasting your eyes on scenery, which never fails to amaze. Vistas are the prettiest we've seen, and there is never a lack of detail. Boss fights were not much better than previous entries, but we're ultimately done the best here despite the bar being on the floor. Ultimately, what I love about A Thief's End is its singular phrasing. This is the end of Nate's story, but not the end of Uncharted. There are still stories to be told. Hell, just the adventures with Sam and Sully alone could fill out a trilogy. The ending leaves enough room for Cassie to be past the torch, and even then, if you want to stay with Nate and Elena, there are sure to be adventures that could be explored there. An immediate issue is that their adventures after Uncharted 4 are seemingly legal and by the book, which don't offer room for shooting at pirates, but again, Cassie, Sam and Sully, or Nadine and Chloe can fill that void. The series chooses to have its swan song not only encompass the themes of the trilogy, but act as a recap along the way. The first game had themes of discovering the truth of your idols and greatness from small beginnings. The second game showed us that there is no honor among thieves and that Nate, in most cases, is just too nice to make it in this business. Uncharted 3 chose to delve into Nate's childhood and his obsession, or competitiveness, and A Thief's End, like any good conclusion, summarizes the focuses of the series, but adds even more information and polish to make crossing the finish line even sweeter. Its gameplay is the best in the series, presentation the same, music the same, and its story, while falling into its old habits at times, otherwise blows it out of the water. An exceptional game to end off an exceptional quadrilogy. One that is fueled by its main theme, passion. 
and I hope Naughty Dog has learned the lesson it preached, which was to not indulge in a passion to the point that it is your doom. This is why I am happy that as of writing, Uncharted 4 is the last we've seen of Nathan Drake. And while the passion of the Uncharted series may be over, the passion project that is Nathan Drake is finally complete. Hello everyone, thank you for watching this video, I greatly appreciate it. I had a lot of fun making it, and I want to say thank you to Sean for editing it. Um, and I wouldn't be able to afford Sean if it weren't for you lovely people supporting me. And so I'd like to give a shout out to our YouTube members and our patrons. We have Egil Sylvanius, Breeze Over, Logan Casey, It's SRTW, Boy Aqua Fan for President, AB, Ben Conway, Bossian, Brian, Chiefy, Cluey, Edgar Sunday, Gonzo Gonzalez, J.MP3, Johnny Be Good, Liam Merzerka, Mambo Number no. 9, uh, Noah, Peanut Butter, Pyrite, Ryan Hutcherson, Sean Bailey, The Gamer Lorian, and Alfhednar A45719. Thank you so much for your continued support. I, I know I need to shut the fuck up about saying thank you. And okay, one last time, thank you for the support on the recent Dishonored video. That was super out of my comfort zone and out of my. I almost want to say out of my depth. I'd never covered a stealth game before, and let alone one that was so atmospheric and different as Dishonored. And so uh, the fact that you guys really liked it is super, super cool. And your feedback to the new voiceover style that's a little more tamed down is uh, really appreciated as well, because I, I was a little, not insecure when making that video, but I was like, oh, I hope they don't mind that I'm not, because I'm normally a little more animated, and I found that, I don't know what it is, I just can't do it anymore, like my voice like cracks when I try to do it, <laughs> and so I, I don't know what's happening with it, um, but seems like it's not an issue, it seems like you guys like it more, so if that's the case, then fuck it, I'm not even, I'm not gonna think twice about it, uh, but yeah, so I hope you aren't too mad at me for getting like faux political about the Nadine stuff, it's just one of those, I couldn't not mention it, and I I feel like it would be I was thinking about it. I'm like well I could just not talk about it because it is that like paradox of if I say hey stop talking about politics I kind of have to talk about politics um, and, and not to say that I think we should stop but I'm saying that the people who don't like it the people who don't like talking about politics should really stop if they don't like it it was one of those things where I feel like it would be weird if I didn't like if I saw a video talking about Uncharted 4 and they just did not mention the issues regarding Nadine or talked about them and did not talk about the explicit reason behind the criticism, which is that people thought it was some sort of SJW insert, then it would be a glaring oversight or something weird. And I didn't want to dance around it. I think uh, most people are, are able to understand that we can, we can have a nuanced or just any sort of discussion around it without getting angry, I hope. You know, watch me get fucking proven wrong in the comments. But anyways, if you guys want to hear more from me and Nam's Companion, we have a podcast that we are putting out episodes every couple of weeks. It's a lot of fun for us. If you want to check out Giant Pokey Spyro, he'll be in the description. I've rambled on for long enough. Um, I love you guys. Take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. And I'll see you next time.